Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm John Broderick, the RSC's Policy Advisor on Climate Change and welcome to this webinar as part of the Royal Society of Chemistry series discussing chemistry and climate change as we look forward to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. For nearly three decades, the United Nations have been bringing together people from almost every country on earth for global climate summits. And as you'd expect, the Royal Society of Chemistry will be showcasing how chemistry is vital for understanding and tackling climate change through a series of online events. We'll be recording this session and all of our panels for those who are not able to join in real time. Today, we're investigating the intersections between plastics and climate change. The RSC has been publishing and promoting research around plastics for a long time, and over the last few years, we've moved into work around waste and plastics policy. You might want to read our plastic explainers online, which cover the topics of recycling, biodegradability, and degradation of plastics. And our website also has policy positions, extensive journals, and our report on science to enable sustainable plastics, along with other sustainability work. In this session, we're bringing together experts to explore how plastics contribute to global emissions through their manufacture, use and end of life treatments, but also how plastics can be more sustainable, whether that's finding alternative feedstocks for their production or using them to replace more polluting materials. We've got some excellent speakers today and we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. So please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A tab, which you should be able to find at the bottom of the bar on the Zoom screen. First up today, we have Professor Veena Sahajwala joining us all the way from Sydney. Professor Sahajwala is an internationally recognised materials scientist, engineer and inventor, revolutionising recycling science. She's the founding director of the Centre for Sustainable Materials Research and Technology at the University of New South Wales, and also heads the Australian Research Council's Industrial Transformation Research Hub for Micro Recycling. Veena, I can see you've joined us there uh, online with your camera. Um, I'd invite you to, uh, to tell us all about your work. Thanks, thanks very much, John, and thanks for the uh, invitation to uh, share some of our journey and experiences um, here from Australia. So I want to really say um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, your interest, and I'm so delighted that uh, so many of us um, as, as researchers, as practitioners in the field, uh, really want to come together and tackle this um, important issue. Um, so as you pointed out, um, the work that I'm going to talk about looks at the, the broader framework around how plastics um, can be seen in a lens where it's not only looking at sustainability from the point of view of plastic as a material itself um, by looking at its recyclability, but also aligning plastics as a feedstock for manufacturing um, other materials. And indeed, some of the work that uh, we do at uh, UNSW, the uh, Smart Centre in Sydney, is about looking at how it can become a valuable resource and a valuable feedstock for manufacturing other materials. And uh, yes, indeed, when we talk about manufacturing other materials, one of the examples I'm going to share with you is making green steel. And um, hold your horses, I'm going to tell you how that is uh, possible. Uh, but one of the things I do want to tell you is a little bit about the Smart Center and how we're looking at uh, broadly the realms of recycling and materials and transformation of materials, which allows us to, of course, look at this important issue of climate change uh, from a holistic point of view. Because, of course, we do understand when we talk about climate and we talk about materials and resources, we're having to think about how we make our materials. So there's the manufacturing side of it, but also the resources that go into making all of these different kinds of important materials and products. So the Smart Center, we're focusing on recyclability, technologies, materials, and ultimately looking at that entire supply chain so that when a material reaches the end of its life, it actually shouldn't be going into landfill or shouldn't be just uh, burnt away for energy, but rather looking at how it might become a renewable resource. So we're used to thinking about energy um, and how energy is renewable, but think about materials and when materials can start to truly become renewable, where we preserve value and we don't downgrade, uh, we don't downcycle, but rather preserve value and enable 
um, materials to be transformed in many different ways. So this is where, of course, the importance of collaboration and partnership between different sectors. And why that's important? Because we don't only see our plastics becoming more plastic and other kinds of plastics, but rather looking at how holistically materials like plastics can actually play such an important part in our entire production and our entire ecosystem. And we have to look at it that way because so many of our plastic materials uh, could well be mixed materials, could be multi-layered, multi-materials, whether they come in the form of food packaging or whether they come in the form of a whole range of consumer products that go into our cars. So, you know, some of the work we're doing here in uh, Australia is looking at a broader realm of how polymeric materials more generally can actually be really useful feedstock. Let me give you one challenging example amongst a whole range of challenging waste resources where packaging, where you might have multi-layered, where plastics and metallics are layered together. Um, we might have, of course, uh, different kinds of electronic devices where there are different kinds of plastics. So the list goes on and on. And how do you actually enable that to truly uh, be transformed in a way that we go beyond recycling and we reform them into different kinds of products is what is indicated in the blue uh, circles that you see. So whether we talk about plastic filaments, we talk about making steel in all of these different useful materials and products, uh, plastics can actually play an important role. And so the vision here for us is very much about conversion into value added materials and really looking at manufacturing in a broader sense so we can constantly grow different ways in which we see manufacturing, not just always look at everything being bigger and bigger on the basis of this notion that everything has to be all about economies of scale, but I'd like to start to also start us to think about economies of purpose. And economies of purpose means that we can actually have distributed manufacturing and that allows us to really create value in so many different ways. So we develop solutions that are fit for purpose. And for that to happen, we need to, of course, understand that it's not just about um, the fundamentals of the materials and the science and the engineering that we do, but also equally importantly, work with end users um, so that therefore we need to be able to test our hypothesis, do the trials and ultimately take on commercial um, commercialization of these kinds of ideas. Innovative solutions, of course, require us to challenge uh, a lot of the traditional ways in which we would have thought about um, transformation of materials. So that brings me to the first uh, transformative solution that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, polymer injection technology, or what we are now calling green steel. In our particular case, green steel is specifically defined as where we are taking waste materials like plastics and tires and using that as an injection material for uh, EAF steel making processes. And why that makes such a big difference is these polymers are rich sources of hydrogen. And when they are introduced inside these steel making furnaces, hydrogen molecules get liberated in situ rapidly, and that then acts as a reductant for that iron oxide. That metallic oxide is then converted into metal. And therefore, you can imagine a scenario in the future where our ability to actually reduce our dependency on coal and coke comes directly as a consequence of the fact that all of these different kinds of waste materials um, are fantastic resources of hydrogen and, of course, elements like carbon that are then utilized as part of the steelmaking process. And we have shown that this is absolutely feasible, possible on a commercial setting, allowing us to also demonstrate that we are able to therefore reduce our consumption of coal and coke. And this is um, what we have developed commercially um, here in Australia. Uh, this technology or this work um, has been supported through the Australian Research Council um, and, and of course our partners, industry partners, Mollycop um, in Australia. I wanted to play this particular video and what you can see on the left hand side is basically traditional coke uh, that is being used, uh, that liquid slag on one side, exact same 
um, slag on the right hand side where you see HDPE, where it now bubbles away and that intensity of that reaction is actually an indication, just simply observing um, the, the bubble that's growing, that slag that is basically capturing all of those gases inside, that hydrogen molecule, allowing that uh, reduction, that conversion of iron oxide into iron to take place. And also importantly, that, that slag forming reaction that you're seeing there, that bubbling from and uh, using uh, HDP in this particular research to show that example is so much more effective uh, compared to coke. The volume of this uh, slag forming is indicative of the fact that the reactions are happening uh, far more efficiently when we use um, these kinds of polymer blends in, inside our steel making furnaces. So that's really just to give you an example that these types of technological advances where you bring together all these uh, range of different kinds of polymeric materials and use that in the process of making steel allows you to use um, feedstock that could not have ordinarily been recycled as, as a resource for making steel. And therefore, uh, one could argue that plastics are actually uh, helping steel uh, become green in this particular case. Uh, so in a much more holistic sense, we have to look at circular economy and, of course, the impact um, on climate by addressing our ability to recycle and reform and continuously produce high quality materials, whether they are, are plastics uh, or, or indeed um, metals. Um, and, and the opportunities, of course, are endless. So what these kinds of images are showing you is that as we capture these in-situ transformations and how the chemistry um, sort of evolves under different conditions uh, inside these types of steel, steel making operations shows that compared to the very first row where there's 100% coke being used, as opposed to a lot of these other polymeric materials, um, we actually get far more efficient reactions and these slag forming reactions have in fact shown that the overall steel making efficiency is enhanced significantly. Um, and uh, again, here an example of how that kind of reaction that you see in the middle of the screen, allowing us to not only carry out slag forming reactions, We've measured uh, hydrogen that is released uh, under these conditions and indeed shown that the reactions that you're seeing there uh, is indeed uh, taking place inside uh, large operating uh, furnaces. So what that brings us is to this whole notion that thinking about um, the three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle um, is, is important, absolutely. Uh, we have to look at conversion of products into many, many different formats. But what if you get to that point where you've got mixtures, um, you've got complex materials uh, where we don't necessarily have a single stream of a given type of plastic, then you have to start to look at, of course, those blends becoming part of that reform where fundamentally that molecule um, that is available in a plastic is allowed to liberate these uh, gases, these tiny molecules of hydrogen, for example, that allow us to then utilize that in a completely different way. And this is where, of course, the ability to think in a way that reforming our waste materials into completely different products is absolutely uh, possible. So the circularity of solutions through collaboration, our partnership with industry, with our research partners, with governments, local governments are so important as they all play a role in looking at waste being seen as a resource, not in this way where it is just a disposed of item, um, as at the end of life in, in a linear economy sense, but rather looking at the circularity and bringing forward all kinds of strategies and solutions that are fit for purpose, whether it's about recovery, recycling, reforming, and really ultimately remanufacturing different kinds of products, which, which creates a whole range of endless possibilities and allows us to truly look at how we can see all kinds of materials being transformed without um, these materials ending up in landfill. And so if you had to do it in a local setting, we've also developed our micro factories on a small scale, uh, many a times where you've got uh, remote uh, and regional communities, we can actually deploy these kinds of micro factories to show that plastics, as in this particular case, you're seeing converted into plastic filaments 
through our microfactory technologies, allowing us to then use those 100% recycled plastic filaments for 3D printing, as you're seeing happening there in that video. So that kind of 3D printing allows us the opportunity to, of course, create a whole range of highly sophisticated products by manufacturing on a small scale locally and therefore creating economies of purpose. The purpose of creating jobs, creating new opportunities, new solutions are so important. So here's one example. We've got uh, these uh, 3D printed clamps uh, that have been manufactured in our micro factory. Uh, they are now being um, trialed and used by a company in Australia. They would have gone off and purchased these kinds of clamps ordinarily um, by sourcing traditional virgin uh, products, um, uh, whereas in this instance, they have uh, indeed uh, uh, chosen to utilize these uh, plastic products made by 3D printing from 100% recycled plastic filaments. So just want to close off by saying the opportunities for us to look at um, all kinds of plastics in a way that we ensure that we're creating decentralized solutions, creating uh, new economies, new jobs, green jobs that allow us to transform our waste into useful resources, enabling us to reduce our carbon footprint um, for many different industries. So thank you very much, uh, John, for this opportunity to share a little bit of our journey with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vina. Uh, what a great place to start. And uh, please do stay to answer some uh, questions from our audience later. So that's just a reminder that um, you're able to Ask questions with the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen and we'll save those up for broader discussion at the end but please do add them while our presenters are speaking so that you don't uh, forget what you were going to we're going to bring bring into it. Um, so our second speaker I'd like to invite is Dr Alejandro Gallego Schmidt from the University of Manchester. Hi, uh, Hi. Dr Gallego Schmidt is a senior lecturer in circular economy and life cycle sustainability. He is part of the Tyndall Manchester Research Group, an interdisciplinary team working on research and climate change sustainability, where he looks at identifying sustainable solutions for industrial, agricultural, construction, water, and energy systems on a life cycle and circular economy basis. So, Alex, can I hand over to you to tell us a little bit more ab about that and about your work? Sure, thank you. First of all, thank you, John. Thank you for the invitation to share our uh, research today. So let me see if I can share my screen. So it should be... Do you see it okay, John? Perfectly, Alex. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead then. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on what part of the world you are at the moment. I'm Alex Gallego-Smith, and as John has said, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about plastic circularity. It's always more sustainable. Okay, I think Bina already has spoken a little bit about circular economy, but just in case that uh, somebody wants to know a little bit more, we live nowadays in a linear economy. More than 90% of the economy of the world now is linear. So basically that means that we take, make, use, and dispose, and we generate a lot of, of non-recyclable waste that is generating a lot of environmental, economic, and social problems. And we have, for example, the sample of the plastics in the ocean. I think is the linear economy is quite well explained here, okay? We have the different stages of the life cycle of a product in, and in all of them in a linear economy, we are generating a lot of waste, but not only waste of materials, but also uh, we are wasting energy. And nowadays, as you know, still most of that energy is coming from fossil fuels. So that linear economy is obviously is inefficient, vulnerable, and wasteful. So don't worry, we have a solution with this circular economy, which is a new paradigm that is alternative to linear uh, models, okay? There are many different, uh, different definitions of circular economy, um, but there is kind of an agreement in these three principles that were proposed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where a circular economy has to, has to try to regenerate natural systems. That means 
to use more renewable sources and use less use or, or use less uh, finite and fossil resources. Principle two will be to keep products and materials in use. That is something that Mina has mentioned before, but not only recycling. Uh, she mentioned some of the airs, but I have uh, more airs. So we have remanufacturing, refurbishing. So there is many things that we can do before uh, recycling. And principle three, is to design out waste and pollution during the whole life cycle of the, of the product, trying to reduce um, negative social and environmental impact. So I hope that everybody have a little bit of what is circular economy. And the other concept that I want to introduce today to those that uh, do not know it still is the, the concept of life cycle sustainability assessment is this conjunction of different tools that allow us through life cycle thinking to calculate the environmental, uh, economic and social impacts of, uh, of a product or a service, okay? So I think it's well, quite well represented over here. What we do, for example, for environmental impacts, we calculate all the impacts associated to the extraction of the raw materials, to production, to distribution, to use and to end, and and also associated to the end of life, okay? So what we do with life cycle assessment, in, in this case for environmental aspects, is to put all these impacts into numbers. Nowadays, we are able to calculate up to 18 different environmental impacts, uh, obviously including, for example, climate change. Okay, now that we know the concept of life cycle assessment and circular economy, this is a study that I want to share with you that, that we did uh, a couple of years ago that was really, uh, we first of all, we want to know the impacts of these three types of single use uh, containers, okay, that are used normally in takeaway restaurants. Just to put uh, this, this study a little bit in context, there is, a, we did a research and between 500 and 850 millions of units of this uh, uh, single use container of these three types are used and disposed yearly in the European Union. So that gives you an idea of how much of these single use containers we are producing nowadays. So basically we have this transparent one with this polypropylene, we have polyesterene that people wrongly call styrofoam, but just in order that, that you know that we, what we are talking about, and is the typical one that we have as a clam cell for burgers, and we also consider uh, the aluminum uh, single-use container, okay? Um, yeah, and these three containers will represent the linear economy, okay, because it's, it's uh, containers that is for a single use, okay? But the other part of the study, we want to know how many times do we have to reuse this Tupperware style container to counteract the impacts of these single use containers, okay? So let's go with the results of the first part, which was to compare these three between, between them, okay? Here you have the results. We studied uh, 12 impact categories but uh, due, to, due, to, due to the space in the slide, I didn't include all of them, but you have to believe me when I said that the polyesterene one, the clam cell was the best uh, environmental alternative in all the impact categories, okay? Including carbon footprint, climate change, okay? So if you see in orange is the, um, the polyesterene uh, in, purple, we have aluminum, and in green, we have polypropylene. In the case of, if we compare the, uh, the polyesterene, the clamshell with aluminum, okay, uh, basically both of them are quite light, okay, but uh, they are not very heavy, but uh, to produce the aluminum, you need much more energy, okay, and that's the reason that it performs worse in all the impact categories, and when we compare the, the polystyrene with the polypropylene, the problem with the popular polypropylene one is that you need much more material, okay? And therefore the impacts are higher, okay? And then let's go to the second part of the study that was, as I mentioned before, to compare how many times do you have to use 
this Tupperware, a reusable Tupperware uh, container to counteract the impacts of the single use containers. And the, the results were maybe quite a little bit shocking, you know, in the sense that depending on the impact categories, the results were quite, quite high, okay? So if we see, for example, if we focus in the, in the comparison of, with the, of the reusable container with a single use polyesterine uh, container for air pollution, you have to reuse the reusable container up to 16 times. With this was the, the lowest in all the categories, okay? For carbon footprint, you can see that you have to use it 18 times, okay? But if we go for a category like resource consumption, which is clearly related with a circular economy, because one of the, of the main aims of circular economy is to reduce the amount of resources that we are using, you can see that you have to use it up to more than 200 times to counteract the impact, okay? And there was a a curious case with that was terrestrial ecotoxicity, where you can never counteract the impact, basically because, you know, the cleaning of the reusable container that you have to do each time have more impact than producing the polyesterine uh, container for this particular impact, okay? So just to summarize, okay, um, from the three types of single-use containers, the one of polyesterene was the one that have the lowest life cycle environmental impacts, okay? If we consider a reusable container, it needs to be reduced between 16 to 208 times, depending on the impact category, compared with the polyesterene single-use container. And actually there was one impact category, terrestrial ecotoxicity that cannot be counteracted, okay? The recycling of polyesterene container is technically possible, possible, but it's not happening really because it's really costly. And obviously this is a very provocative example. Okay, normally circular economy uh, principles are, or when you apply circular economy principle is more, is more normally more sustainable, but we have to study case by case. That's, that's the main, outcome from this from this study okay so we need to understand better when circular means sustainable for that using life cycle assessment is very uh, a very useful tool okay uh, i know that we we are going to be talking today about climate change i think climate change is really important but we have to analyze also other environmental impacts because there are potential trade offs and i don't think that nobody wants to reduce uh, climate change or tackle climate change uh, at the expenses of increasing human toxicity, for example. So I think that we have to consider other environmental uh, impacts. And for that, again, life cycle assessment is very useful because we are able to calculate, to put into numbers and to up to 18 different uh, impacts. Um, having this vision, this systematic vision, Considering all the uh, life cycle stages is really important in these uh, cases, okay? And actually going beyond the product, you know? So seeing how cha making changes in one product affect the whole system is the, the kind of approach that we have to have nowadays, okay? And very important just to highlight, okay? Uh, life cycle assessment tools uh, are very useful. Um, because it allows you to have a multi-criteria analysis to put into numbers, environmental, social, and economic aspects. It's very interesting if you have, for example, a new technology, a new uh, type of plastics, we can, and you intuitively think that it's better, for example, from the environmental perspective, we can put that into numbers. We can compare uh, this new approach uh, with the business as usual. So. If you are interested to collaborate, please contact me. And also it allows us to uh, establish or to, to see what are the main hotspots, what are the two or three things that are contributing to most of the impacts. So as always, uh, acknowledgement for people that have collaborated in this work, because obviously I don't do these things alone, okay? And also to the, to the funders. 
and uh, some references. And if there is any questions, you have there my email. And I also, um, uh, as I am a very modern guy, I have my Twitter account as well there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Alex. I've seen that we've had a couple of questions come in, but I think they are kind of quite open questions. So if it's okay by you, I'll save those over and we'll take them to general discussion uh, afterwards. And we'll move on to our third speaker now. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Taylor Yukert from Colorado. Uh, so spanning the time zones today. Uh, Taylor completed her PhD in chemistry at the University of Cambridge where she worked in the Reisner lab to develop scalable photocatalytic systems for transforming plastic and mixed waste into hydrogen fuels. Uh, she recently joined the National Renewable Energy Lab in the US and is a postdoctoral re researcher focusing on modeling tools that assess the impact of the circular economy on plastics and various renewable technologies. So that's a nice segue across. Taylor, are you uh, okay to fire over the presentation then. Yeah, all ready to start. Thank you so much, John. Uh, let me just share my screen. Perfect, we can see that. Great. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, today I'll be discussing recycling strategies that help combat the enormous wave of plastic waste that we're increasingly experiencing. Now, the majority of this talk will focus on one strategy in particular called photoforming, and that was the basis of my doctoral research. And then at the end, I want to give a really brief preview to some of the exciting work on plastics that we're starting to conduct at the National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL. So I'd like to start by asking you to spend a couple moments looking around yourself and thinking about what sort of plastic products you might throw away today. You know, maybe there's some food pocket packaging or an old pen or an empty soda bottle. Well, all of those items quickly add up and globally we produce 78 million tons of plastic packaging each year. That's roughly how much 8,000 Eiffel Towers weigh. Plastic production in general accounts for between 4 and 8% of global annual oil use. And while that might not seem like a huge number, it will only increase as plastic consumption does, and every percentage point counts when trying to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Now, with the prevalence of programs like Blue Planet 2 that highlight the enormous environmental impact of plastic pollution, especially in our oceans, it might not come as a surprise to you that of that produced plastic packaging, 40% of it is landfilled and another 32% leaks directly into the environment. But what might surprise you is that although 14% of all plastic packaging is collected for recycling worldwide, only 2% actually ends up being recycled back into the original product. The reasons for this low number will differ from country to country, but two reasons that I would like to briefly highlight today are size and complexity. Many polymer products are actually composites, meaning they're made of multiple layers of different materials adhered together. Or alternatively, alternatively, they might just be really small. So think straws or sachets or cotton swabs. And these characteristics make those products difficult, if not impossible, to sort into pure single plastic streams. And if you can't separate different polymers, you end up with inferior quality recycled plastic. So how can we start to address some of these issues that are associated with the current uh, state of plastic recycling and start to recover more value from more polymeric waste? And this is where photoforming comes in. Photoforming uses sunlight and photocatalyst, which is simply a material that can make a chemical reaction happen faster to simultaneously break down plastic waste and generate hydrogen. Now, why hydrogen, you might be wondering. Well, hydrogen has many applications in the chemical and fertilizer industries, um, as our first speaker mentioned, also in the steel industry, and it could potentially also serve as a fuel and heating source in the near future. To give a little bit more detail about what happens during this simple photoforming process, it begins when sunlight shines upon a photocatalyst, which for my research was an environmentally friendly material called carbon nitride. That sunlight gives the electrons in the photocatalyst enough energy to break down water into hydrogen gas. 
The holes remaining in the valence band then drive the breakdown of plastic into smaller organic molecules. So there are two chemical reactions happening simultaneously, which enables us to not only generate a valuable fuel, but also mitigate waste that might be difficult to dispose of otherwise. But how well does this process actually work? To give you an example, this graph shows the amount of hydrogen you're producing per gram of plastic over the course of 50 hours of irradiation. We specifically use polar plastics, such as polylactic acid or PLA, which is a biodegradable polymer that a lot of edgeware you might have seen is made of, as well as polyethylene terephthalate or PET, which is most commonly found in drink bottles and food packaging and accounts for 10% of global plastic waste. After about a week, we're able to convert between six and 7% of these plastics into hydrogen, as well as small organic molecules like formate and acetate. It also turns out that photoforming works not just with pure plastics, but also with products that cannot be currently recycled. So that includes polyester microfibers, which are found in your synthetic clothing and just can't be recycled because they're too small, as well as oil contaminated PET which can't be recycled due to the food contamination. We can also look beyond plastic alone and generate hydrogen from different types of food and mixed waste. So this starts to give us some unique advantages in terms of versatility in comparison to other recycling processes, all while addressing those size and complexity issues that I mentioned back in my introductory slide. Now, a graph is one thing, uh, but to give you more of a visual, hopefully you can see this video of a piece of a PET water bottle immersed in a solution containing our photocatalyst. When we shine light on it, you can start to see the hydrogen bubbles forming. And this is in real time, it's, it's not spread up at all. Now we also immobilize the photocatalyst on a glass panel, which is important for upscaling and real world processes in which immobilization will make it easier for you to reuse the photocatalyst over multiple cycles. We showed that these immobilized photocatalyst panels can produce hydrogen from a range of plastic and mixed waste and could be upscaled from the vial in that previous video, which was just one centimeter in diameter to this uh, flow reactor shown in this photo which has an area of 25 square centimeters. The panels also turn out to be crucial for generating hydrogen from dark real world waste that would otherwise prevent light from reaching the photocatalyst. So this graph here shows that we can generate hydrogen under both ideal conditions, so that's maximal sunlight and high purity water, as well as more realistic conditions. So we're talking 20% uh, uh, of the maximal sunlight, and that's more similar to what you'd have here in the UK, as well as in seawater. And this is a critical step when we're thinking about the overall sustainability and economic viability of a commercial scale photoreforming setup. So far, I've given you a taste of what photoforming can accomplish, but it's an important question to ask whether this technology is actually as green as it sounds. And to answer this, I modeled a hypothetical photoforming pilot plant, which is shown in the top right uh, scheme on this slide. I could then calculate the carbon footprint, which uh, we just learned about in terms of life cycle assessment. So that's how many greenhouse gases are emitted per a certain amount of hydrogen that we're producing. And basically what this showed us was that with some improvements in efficiency, we can produce hydrogen with a lower environmental impact than existing waste to fuel technologies like gasification or pyrolysis. Photoforming also emits 40% uh, fewer greenhouse gases than disposing of waste in a landfill. And from an economic perspective, there's still a lot of things to improve, such as our photocatalyst efficiency and lifetime. But all of these topics and more are still being pursued in the Reisner Lab, and my successors at Cambridge are also exploring the commercialization potential of photoforming, hopefully to uh, bring it closer to real-world application within the next 10 years or so. And that actually brings me to my current research at NREL as part of the Bottle Consortium. There are a lot of new plastic recycling technologies out there. This list is by no means exhaustive, and it can be really difficult to decide which technologies are most worth pursuing, especially when they often exhibit trade-offs. 
For example, mechanical recycling is very energy efficient and emits minimal greenhouse gases, but it often produces lower quality polymer due to those sorting issues that I mentioned earlier. Glycolysis, ethanolysis, and enzymatic processes, on the other hand, give you pure monomers that can be used to make virgin quality PET, but they're more energy intensive and expensive. So the aim of this project is to quantitatively assess and compare plastic recycling technologies based on a series of different economic, energetic, and environmental metrics. Using those results, we then aim to provide recommendations for research areas that might need a bit more improvement, as well as areas that might benefit from government support. We're really excited about the wide scope of this project and hope that it can serve as a really reliable benchmark for improving plastic recycling in the future. And with that, I'd like to sum up by saying that we do have a plastic problem, not necessarily with the material itself, but rather with how we use and dispose of it. But there is hope for the future. Photoforming is a sunlight driven technique for converting waste into hydrogen fuel. And it's also just one of many exciting new recycling technologies that are trying to change how we treat our plastic. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, do check out these websites or get in touch with me directly. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A session. That was great. Thank you very much, Taylor. That was a, a fascinating, um, introduction to another different methodology and approach. Um, we've got more questions coming in and similarly I'll like to carry those over to the end to a, to a bit of a panel discussion um, and please say that we're joined by our fourth and final speaker uh, Dr Jenny Garden from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, so Dr Garden was the first recipient of the Christina Miller Research Fellowship and leads the Garden Group with research focusing on the design and synthesis of new homo and hetero metallic complexes and their application towards homogeneous catalysis and the production of polymers. Uh, she has also previously worked on the utilization of carbon dioxide in polymerization. And I'm pleased to say in 2021, Jenny was awarded the RSC's Sir Edward Franklin Fellowship. Uh, Jenny, thank you for joining us. Um, are you ready to go? Is your uh, PowerPoint going to uh, appear? Fingers crossed, yes, thank you. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Perfectly. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, it's been really great to see the, the talk so far and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm planning to cover sort of the more technical aspect of uh, plastic production and opportunities to improve the sustainability of these productions. So we can look at any situation as a glass that's half empty or as a glass that's half full, um, as a challenger, as an a, a, an opportunity. But when it comes to plastics, we've really seen a huge amount in the media recently about the negative impact of plastics. And it's true that these have really um, caused a lot of damage to the environment. And we've seen some really scary images of this over the past few years. But I think we're hopefully all aware that plastics actually really do bring many benefits to the environment as well. So it's been estimated that in Europe, plastic packaging has reduced uh, CO2 emissions by 190 million tonnes per year. Within the UK, um, the transport sector became the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in 2016 and it's been estimated that these emissions would have been double if we didn't have lightweight plastic components in cars and transport vehicles. And building insulation also reduces our heating bills and um, the, the energy um, and emissions associated with those heating processes. So the problem isn't necessarily plastics but there are problems around their persistence and there's problems around the way in which we interact interact with and manage these materials, particularly at their, their end of life. So we've already seen some really nice slides covering uh, this sort of linear um, mode of plastic production. So at the moment, the vast majority of plastics are made from petrochemicals, so natural gas and oil. And from these, we can extract chemicals and then we can make um, different plastic materials that are used. So a really high proportion of plastics are in this linear economy where they're made, used and disposed of. And the numbers for recycling will depend on what source you look at. But generally, these are still very low. And as was already covered, a very low amount is in this secondary recycling loop. So there's a real need for us to try and improve the sustainability of these processes and transition towards a circular economy. But what does that look like? Like, can we make uh, an ideal plastic? 
So I think for us to think about this, we really need to consider how plastics are made and used across their whole life cycle. So taking this whole systems approach. And um, I think if we had our wish list, we would ideally like to make plastics from renewable seed stocks. And um, so making them from plants, which can themselves lock carbon dioxide up into the, um, the plant structure, or maybe um, making them directly from carbon dioxide itself. With current plastic production, it's estimated that by 2050, plastics industry will generate 2.8 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. So this is a really colossal amount and is just not sustainable. So I think chemistry has a really important role to play in terms of developing efficient processes underpinned by catalysis and um, processing. And as we heard from Taylor, then recycling of plastics is also a really key feature. And um, so whether those could be directly converted back into uh, new materials um, or if they can't be recycled, can they be degraded if they were to be leached to the environment, which isn't where these sh materials should ideally end up? If they did, could they degrade into something that's non-toxic? Um, or could we break them down and then convert them to useful chemicals that could be used for other processes or maybe for making plastic? So as a starting material for plastic production. So this is already quite a complicated combination of different factors, but I think on top of this, we would also like to be able to make materials that can match the material properties of some of the current plastics that are used, or maybe even to make plastics that can perform unique functions that the current materials cannot. So this is quite a challenging situation, and um, it's something that I think makes it really interesting, but also uh, challenging, is the fact that there's a real and for plastics that are still fit for purpose during their use, but that they can be degraded at a point of choosing. So this is quite a fine balance point to try and get. So I think an opportunity here um, comes from looking at incorporating carbon oxygen bonds into the polymer structure. So many conventional plastics have strong carbon-carbon bonds in that polymer structure like polyethylene and polypropylene, whereas if we introduce uh, carbon oxygen bonds um, in the forms of, of polyesters such as polylactic acid, which is shown in the top right here, then we introduce these breakpoints into the polymer chain. So polylactic acid is arguably one of the most successfully commercialized polymers that's made from biomass. So it can be made from plant materials like sweet corn or sugar cane. And the life cycle analysis has been done on this material. So as Alex highlighted the importance of life cycle analysis, but what's quite nice about this material is that this, these studies suggest that it produces less CO2 emissions than conventional plastics like polyethylene and polypropylene. But I think what's quite interesting about this material is really that it kind of, we can view it almost as a concept piece where you can reversibly make and break some of the chemical bonds in this structure to form this polymer material. Now it's worth just highlighting that just because something is derived from biomass, doesn't necessarily mean that it can be biodegraded. And um, polyesters in general are an interesting class of materials that many of them can be degraded, but, but not all of them can be. So this does depend on the material structure. But I also want to highlight that um, this is not a one size fits all solution. We use plastics for such a wide range of different products and processes that it's likely to need a complement of different materials. So as well as polylactic acid as a promising uh, plastic made from renewable feedstocks, then there are other routes to access polyesters with different chemical structures and different properties. So one of these routes is to take an epoxide and an anhydride and to copolymerize these together. And you'll note that we still have these carbon oxygen bonds as the breakpoints in the polymer chain. So because we have two monomers, then this can introduce an opportunity to change lots of the different functional groups along the structure. And by changing these different chemical groups, we can change the properties of the material. So some of these can be derived from biomass. And one particularly interesting example of this is limonene oxide, which is something that can be obtained from orange peels, and um, which is a waste product of the juicing industry. We can also look at replacing the anhydride with carbon dioxide to generate polycarbonate materials. So this is a way to lock carbon dioxide up into the structure of the polymer. And then these materials can actually be derivatized further by reacting with the diisocyanate to form polyurethanes, which you've probably used as they're um, in running shoes and the soles, um, coatings and cars and white goods, or even maybe the, the sofa or 
mattress that you might be sitting on right now um, could be made of these um, foamed polyurethanes. So life cycle analysis has also been done on incorporating 20% of carbon dioxide into the structure of a polyurethane. And again, this reduces the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, something that's been quite interesting is that the carbon dioxide taken from flue gas, so from power stations, has been tested with these processes. And while there are some impurities in, in these uh, source of carbon dioxide, some catalysts do show some signs of being able to tolerate some of these impurities. So there's some early um, promise in terms of this uh, strategy for being able to make materials from waste CO2. One thing that I just want to highlight with these uh, greenhouse gas emissions is that although this reduces the greenhouse gas emissions, it's not a net sink for CO2. So it still produces CO2 to make these materials. So as chemists, I think there's a really exciting opportunity to try and make these processes more sustainable. And this can be underpinned by catalysis and processing. And in the last minute or two, I just want to touch on a couple of examples that we've looked at. So um, this graph here uh, shows the catalyst performance for this anhydride and epoxide copolymerization. And the bar on the left you'll notice is significantly higher than these other three. And this is because the purple bar represents a catalyst that has two different metals in its structure. In this case, it's magnesium and zinc. So by incorporating these two different metals and having them close to each other, we can improve the catalyst performance compared to the equivalents where there are either two magnesium two zincs or a mixture of the dimagnesium and the di-zinc complexes. So by using these heterometallic complexes we can enhance the catalyst performance. Um, we've also been able to do this with a series of complexes for polylactic acid synthesis, um, taking complexes that combine an alkali metal, which gives high activity, along with zinc, which gives good control over the polymerization. And using some related catalysts to these, we've also been able to use, make a range of different materials based on polylactic acid, combining these with other um, ester monomers. So making block copolymers where we have part of the structure that features polylactic acid, and then another part that features uh, polycaprolactone, polybutyrolactone, or a combination of all three. And, and again, as a key thing, we have these breakpoints from these carbon oxygen uh, units in that polymer backbone. So just to summarise, um, what we need for the future, well, this is a, a complicated question, but I think some big opportunities uh, exist in terms of looking at substituting some conventional materials with some uh, more sustainable alternatives. If we can make plastics that are higher performing, then we might actually be able to use less material and that might um, improve the, the sustainability because we wouldn't need to use as much um, of some of these plastics. And I think there's a real potential for using oxygenated polymers with these carbon oxygen bonds in the uh, polymer structure. In terms of chemistry and making the processes as efficient as possible, then catalysis and looking at new processing methods and reduce the energy associated with making these, these materials. And um, I think there's real opportunities in terms of materials recycling or also converting these materials into new and useful chemicals. So I think this is a very interdisciplinary challenge, but chemistry is going to be a key voice within this. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jenny, for that, uh, that excellent uh, overview of your, of your work. Um, I, can I invite our other panellists to join us on camera now as we move to a, a, a Q&A uh, discussion and uh, you'll see that we've got um, a few that have appeared in the uh, Q&A box but actually I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and, and I'd like to kick off because I'm, I'm looking towards uh, the COP in Glasgow and I'm conscious they're a very kind of international and broadly experienced uh, group of researchers and I'm just wondering how do you think uh, governments can act internationally on climate change and, and plastic production and plastic waste. Is there something that you uh, think we would uh, benefit from as an a, agreement at an international level? Um, I wonder if, uh, Vina, you've got any thoughts on that first and then we'll go around the panel. Oh, Vina, I'm afraid we've lost your audio. How about maybe if I move to... Alex, while Vina tries to figure that out. 
Okay, first of all, uh, great presentations. I love all of them. Congratulations to all the other panelists. Uh, I think it's really important uh, to, to consider again, and I think so, it's something that has been highlighted by in all the presentations, is how we can implement, for example, circular economy principles and how is that related with, with the reduction of the emissions uh, of, of climate change, you know? There was some study of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that said that 55% of the emissions are related with energy, how we produce it, how we consume it, but 45% is related with materials, you know, how we produce them, how we produce food, okay? and Actually, the same study said that if we implement circular economy principles to just four materials, which is steel, plastic, uh, cement, and aluminium, we will be able to reduce to half this 45% of emissions that are coming from materials, okay? So I think, obviously, we are in a climate emergency, so we have to do everything that we can, okay? And don't get me wrong, using renewables, going to decarbonize uh, the, the electricity mix or the energy mix is something that we have to do, but also we have to tackle the other things, you know? And there are some emissions that are not related with energy, you know? So, and we have to tackle them. For example, you know, uh, methane emissions from food waste, that's not related with energy and we have to tackle them, okay? So I think, you know, not only for plastics, but in general, I think uh, trying to implement all these things that we have been talking about, using resources more efficient, closing loops, upgrading, you know, all these principles related with circular economy, directly and indirectly are gonna help to reduce uh, uh, climate or greenhouse emissions. Thanks, Alex. You mentioned again, the overlap between kind of systems and materials there. V, now I'm going to come back to you. Hopefully your microphone's working now. Hey, yeah, let me know if this is, uh, is. This is coming Great. through. Good. Um, yeah, no, look, I mean, uh, Alejandro made a really good point. I mean, we have to be able to look at the holistic system where it's not just about the energy production, but it's very much about how we, in fact, look at making materials. So the embedded energy that goes into making materials in the first instance, we need to be able to preserve that by bringing those materials back into production over and over again. So one of the first things we have to be very mindful is that we don't actually undervalue these materials. So, you know, you don't end up making such low quality products that all you do is you get a single life out of it. And I think to me, that's going to be a really key message that we really look towards preserving quality uh, and where it is just single use, low value, I think we have to really stop and think whether we really do need those single use plastics. You know, I mean, I think we, we hear about things like straws and plastic cutlery and, and really just all of those things that fall into that uh, low um, uh, lifespan. And I think if we think about the lower lifespan, I think we just have to be very strict about how, how we can all play a role. I mean, in Australia, policies um, are coming into effect. Uh, that we are going to be looking towards, in fact, these kinds of uh, bans. So I think from, from the perspective of, you know, where governments and all of us as consumers can play a part is to really stop consuming those really uh, single short lifespan products and really make sure that whatever we make can actually be, uh, you know, be brought back into production over and over again. So, so we really have to be mindful. We can't afford to have food packaging uh, that will end up in landfill. I think one of the speakers brought that up as to how much of that food packaging um, ends up in landfill. And I know my favorite kettle chips uh, as an example, if I can use that uh, case in point where you've got you know, polymer and metallics lining in it is, is uh, you know, we have to take that case in point. We have to find a new way to solve that problem. Um, and we have to make sure that we don't end up putting a lot of those. Cause you know, by throwing away that alum, uh, um, plastic into landfill, don't forget we're also throwing away aluminium. And I think Alex made that point as well with food packaging. You know, we simply cannot live in an economy where it's okay to throw away uh, all of these kinds of food containers and others. I think we just have to, you know, use our own proper food containers as, as an example. So the things we can do and I think there are things we as consumers and governments and businesses, we all need to play a part. 
Thanks, Vina. Uh, Taylor, Jenny, is there anything that you'd particularly like to say on this issue of kind of international collaboration? Taylor? Yeah, I just um, had a couple small points on there, but, but first I have to disclose that this is my view and does not represent NREL or the United States government. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of climate change, I think it's just, this is such a global problem. We really need to be thinking not just in terms of our own countries and improving our energy efficiencies, implementing renewable energy, also need to be thinking about how this ties in with everyone around the globe. And in terms of plastic in particular, I think this is a big issue in the United States because we are actually the biggest producers of plastic waste, but we're also the second biggest exporter of plastic waste. So it won't matter so much if we implement recycling here as if we do not also help where we're exporting that plastic to, to sustainably reuse and recycle that plastic. So I think we really need these international agreements to try to work together and build a sustainable ecosystem. Thank you, Taylor. Jenny? Thanks. Yes, I very much um, echo echoes Taylor's points. And, you know, I think this is a global challenge and it's going to need global solutions where we all have to take responsibility and work together as a global community to try and address that. I think certainly with um, plastics, we can see even within research groups, you know, kind of doing like their own, uh, you know, new advances and things. But if that's kind of done in silos and without this joined up thinking or understanding the life cycle analysis or the impacts that that might have to different communities, then um, um, sometimes those solutions are not the best overall. So I think really having informed solutions from a, a joined up thinking um, is going to be the best way to address this challenge. Thanks, Jenny. Now, I'm conscious that we've come to the end of our time. Um, I'm going to take a little liberty. I'm going to thank everyone now uh, who has joined us and, and entirely appreciate if you have to leave. But we've had a couple uh, of questions from the audience. If there's a moment or two longer, um, particularly this question about using um, natural fibres in our um, feedstocks for green plastics. Uh, this is something that I think would re relate to uh, Alejandro's and, and Jenny's work particularly. Um, so, I mean, Jenny, do you think that, um, that, that those processes will be likely to, on the large scale, reduce emissions? I think it's, it's probably coming that one of the other speakers mentioned earlier, where I think a lot of these things are likely to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, for example, with um, some bamboo toothbrushes and things like that, okay, they might be made from natural sources and they might be uh, faster to degrade at the end of the life than some of the conventional plastic toothbrushes. But in terms of the CO2 emissions associated with those, they're really not necessarily lower. And so um, I think, I'm afraid it's not an easy answer because the like likelihood is that each different product will have a slightly different situation. So I think this again kind of points towards the emphasis of these um, life cycle analyses and um, the kind of access of information and um, the conversations happening, which is why it's great to see events like today so that people can try and make the most informed choices possible and just make it slightly more complicated for some materials that will then involve a bit of a personal element about how you personally interact with that material. So for example, if you use a cotton bag and you repair that and you use it hundreds and hundreds of times it probably is the most sustainable choice whereas actually if um you uh you know it reuse plastic bags actually they, they are so low in energy and co2 emissions to produce that actually for some people instead of buying a few expensive nice looking cotton bags and throwing them away after five or ten uses reusing a plastic bag might be the most sustainable option so i think it's probably an opportunity for us all to look at our own uh behaviors and the way we interact with materials as well as just the um the way in which those are, are made so um it's likely to be quite a personal decision for for different items so hopefully that helps to answer the question it does. Thank you. Does anyone else have something that, oh, Alex, I see you want to have a brief input? Yeah, very brief. Uh, I, I fully agree with with uh, Jenny. I think we have to look case by case, okay? And uh, just because something is from natural fiber, doesn't mean that doesn't mean exactly that it's sustainable, okay? Because maybe you have used a lot of fertilizers or a lot of energy to grow that, okay? And at the end, it's having a lot of impact, okay? Theoretically, initially, it seems that can be more sustainable, but we have to look case by case, okay? And also, I always have my mentality of life cycle assessment. So I step, okay, 
the raw materials. Okay, let's go to the use. Okay, and I think something that Je Jenny mentioned, you know, is the you know is is the properties the same one as the one that we we are normally using? You know, do you want a food container that is gonna disint disintegrate with the food that did because it doesn't have the proper qualities? You know, so it's something that we have to look after as well. And finally, the end of life. Okay, so just because if something is from a biological origin, it doesn't mean that it's just gonna disappear, okay? So, I mean, we have to see case by case. We have to see if in our munis municipalities, we have industrial composting, you know, that is gonna decompose this, um, this container, you know, because at the end, if not, it's gonna be ending in a landfill, you know, it's gonna be ending in the, in the oceans and, probably is not going to be a degradate, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be from a biological origin, but it's not going to degrade, degradate because it, there are not the right conditions to be uh, degraded. So again, I think it's very complicated and that's the reason that we are having these meetings, you know, and there is no silver uh, bullet to, to, to all cases, you know, we have to analyze case by case and see what are the best solution in each case we, that can be maybe not the best solution in other cases. Well, thank you, uh, Alex and Jenny, for wrapping that up. I think in that discussion, we've captured answers to quite a few of the questions that have come up uh, during the course of the uh, webinar. And so I thank you, our audience, for, for putting those to our panelists and for our panelists for their uh, contributions. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up now with a few uh, final comments. Uh, I'd just like to direct you towards our website and uh, other resources where you can find out um, more about our work on um, plastics with our explainers and our uh, sustainability policy positions. And this is only one of a number of events uh, running in the run up to the climate change negotiations. If you'd like to find out more on that, please go to rsc.li forward slash COP26 uh, and keep an eye out on our social media channels. So I look forward to uh, seeing more of our audience and uh, thank all our panelists once again for um, watching today's webinar. Goodbye.